at uh, the seventh, is that right? The seventh commandment, yeah. Thou shalt not commit adultery. It's Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Exodus 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. As we continue working through our series on the Ten Commandments. Let's pray together as ask the Lord's blessing upon the study of his word today. Father, as we get into your word this morning, we pray that you would um, show us things in our own lives that, that need to be corrected. Uh, Lord, bring, bring that correction, bring healing, bring uh, encouragement, bring peace, bring hope. Uh, Lord, do what you need to do in our hearts and lives so that we can give you even more glory as we live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So as we think about this commandment of you shall not commit adultery, I guess we need to just start out defining what adultery is. I think most of you probably have an idea of what it is, and you're probably close to correct in what you're thinking. Adultery is marital infidelity. It is unfaithfulness, breaking your marriage vows to be that, that you took when you were at the altar and getting married, wherever that might be. Uh, faith To be faithful and true to each other till death shall part you. And it's, it's when either a husband or wife has sexual relations with someone other than their spouse, at least the physical act of adultery. It's, it's sexual sin, it's what adultery is. So another closely related sin to this, according to the Bible, is the sin of fornication. Fornication is sexual relations between two unmarried people, or it could be between someone who is married and someone who is not. Um, fornication comes from the Greek word pornea, P-O-R-N-E-A, which is where we get the word pornography that we use today, or porn for short. You could rightly refer to fornication as pornication, and you would be accurate. So all adultery is fornication, it's sexual sin, but not all fornication is adultery, if that makes sense. So adultery is a sin according to God's word, that can be committed by deed, by thought, and by word. And I think we all know about the deed part. Don't think I have to take a deep dive into that for us today, I think we understand that. It's pretty obvious nowadays, it, it should be obvious that we live in a sex-saturated society, do we not? It is amazing how much we see and hear that has to do with sexuality. And a very large part of it that we see and hear is wrong when it comes to sexuality because it does not uphold what the Bible teaches about love and sexuality and marriage. Sexuality comes at us from all directions and because we get hit with it so much, all day, every day it seems like, we become numb to it and sort of accepting of it. Like, well, what else do you expect, you know? Or, or at least we don't think much of it. And I think it's sad that we can get so numb to things that are so blatantly wrong. So much of our culture is suffering from sexual brokenness because of the misuse of sex and the redefinition of gender and gender roles assigned to males and females by God himself. Sex outside of the boundaries that God has limited it to leads to brokenness, hurt, divorce, disease, and death. And this commandment from God, you shall not commit adultery, uh, is for our good. God knows what's good for us. He knows what's best. Now, I'm not saying that all marriages are perfect. We know that's not true, unless maybe I'm wrong. Anyone here have the perfect marriage? 
I don't, okay, no, not here at least. So any of you watching later on YouTube, uh, come to Emmanuel, there's no perfect marriage. <laughs> um, but what I am saying is if both the husband and the wife work at the marriage 100%, 100%, not 50-50, to, to make their marriage work, I don't think that our country and our communities, our families and our friends would be in the mess that a lot of them are in. Just throwing that out there. So I think we understand the, the deed side of this sin, how that is wrong and sinful, how that can happen. But what about the thought side of adultery? Generally, we won't commit a physical sin without first thinking about it and considering. So take your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter five and let's see what Jesus said about the thought of adultery. Mark, excuse me, Matthew chapter five, verses 27 through 30. And let's look and see what Jesus had to say about it. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. Jesus says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it's more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Have you ever heard that? That's some serious stuff right there. Jesus said that even looking with lust amounts to adultery being committed in the heart. I didn't even turn this on. Sorry, y'all. Maybe that'll help. So according to Jesus, the Son of God, you cannot limit the sin of adultery to only a physical deed. It starts with a thought in the heart that also itself is a sin. So Jesus takes it further and he shows how serious this is to the point that he says to amputate that which causes you to sin because it's better for you to have part of your body be cut off than for your whole body to be cast into hell. That's serious. That's major uh, stuff right there. So as, as you think about this whole idea of sexuality, adultery, and deed, and thought, and then in word, which we'll get to in a minute, um, and then Jesus saying, if your right eye causes you problems with this, cut it off. If your arm causes you problems, cut it off. What would that mean for you if you need to, to pluck out the things that are in your life that are causing you to sin in this area? What would that mean for you as far as what you read or what you watch or what you listen to or what you browse online or on your phone? What would the Lord tell you to do about that? Is there something that you need to cut off, cut out from those areas? Now, I'm sure, given the statistics I've heard and everything, that there's someone in this room today who struggles with the lure of pornography. It's easy to find nowadays. You don't have to go to some store and look on the behind the shelves or whatever however you used to have to do that kind of stuff it's easy to find nowadays 
Sometimes it finds you without you even having to try. And it's hugely addicting. It is a drug. And it can and will consume you if you don't cut it off. So looking with lust and whatever else that might lead to is sin according to the word of God. In fact, if you'll turn back to Proverbs chapter 5 with me for a moment. In the Old Testament, if you go to Psalm and then find Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 5 verses 15 through 23, there's, there's some good wisdom given here about instead of giving in to the desire of your flesh in this area, what ought you to do? Proverbs 5, 15 through 23, look at what it says here. Drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets? Let them be only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord, and he ponders all his paths. His own iniquities entrap the wicked man, and he's caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. So there's not a good end for the person who, can, who gives in to adultery and sexual sin. So heed the word of the Lord, heed scripture, and don't go there. God knows what's best. God has designed it in a way that you function within God's boundaries, things are gonna be a whole lot better for you. So I would encourage you also, uh, if you guys are note takers, just to jot down like Proverbs 5, 1 through 14, the first half of that chapter, we didn't even read that. Those are good verses about this. Proverbs, that's Proverbs 5, 1 through 14. And then over in Proverbs 6, verses 20 to 35, those are very good related to this same issue. And then in Proverbs 7, verses 6 through 27, those are also good verses that relate to this subject. So there's a lot of wisdom in Proverbs about this. Why not to? You know, God said, you shall not commit adultery. And then the proverb, the, the writer there gives you a lot of good reasons why you shouldn't do that. So these all have to do, those scriptures I gave you, with the consequences of adultery and sexual sin. So learn from God's word. Arm yourself with good theology and train yourself to think rightly about marriage and sexuality for your good, for the good of your marriage, for the good of your children, your grandchildren, and your Christian witness and God's glory. So another thing about uh, sexuality and marriage and all that's related here, God created marriage and sexuality for procreation and for pleasure. God has limited sex to the boundaries of the marriage bed between husband and wife. Um, I'll just throw this verse out for you. Hebrews 13, verse 4. It says, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Man, another serious heavy verse. Who will God judge? Fornicators and adulterers. 
Well, and then we've talked about committing adultery in deed and in thought, but let's talk about committing this sin in word. You might say, well, how do you do that? What's that look like? It's basically saying out loud what you're thinking in your head. Things like, I sure would like some of that. Or, man, what I'd like to do with her. Or whatever, something along those lines. Whatever you might come up with. It would also include whatever you would say to entice someone to commit that sin with you. So deed, thought, and word. Adultery can be committed physically, no doubt, we all know that. It can also be committed emotionally. People have emotional affairs online, on their phones, at the water cooler, at work. Emotional affairs, or let's just call it what it really is, emotional adultery, very often leads to physical adultery. And then it can be committed mentally by our thoughts. We already read what Jesus said about that. But let me lastly mention another way adultery can be committed, and that is spiritually. Spiritually. Spiritual adultery is being unfaithful to the Lord. It occurs when you put anything or anyone in your life ahead of God. It's when you prioritize anything higher than God. Basically, the Bible would call that idolatry. Anything you put ahead of God in your life is an idol. So spiritual adultery happens when you don't seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, as you were told by the Lord Jesus. It happens when you don't trust in the Lord with all your heart, as the Proverbs tell you. It happens when you don't delight yourself in the Lord, as the psalmist tells you to, but you delight yourself in other things ahead of the Lord, and that creates a wrong order of affections in your life. It happens when you don't love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It happens when you love the world and the things of the world. It happens when you become friends with the world. In other words, James reminds us in James chapter four, verse four, James says, adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Again, that's another hard word from God, but it's corrective and it's good for us. It's loving, it's helpful. So I would just tell you this, all of you here today, all of you watching later, you cannot trust God too much. The devil will tell you you can and that you will miss out on so much if you get too fanatical about obeying God. But what the devil won't tell you is that if you obey God, what you will miss out on is heartache and misery. Uh, excuse me. I got that wrong. I read the wrong line. I'm sorry. I messed up. <laughs> what the devil won't tell you is that if you obey God, what you will miss out on is satisfaction, contentment. This is if you obey God. Blessedness, assurance, forgiveness, healing, care, faithfulness, love, righteousness, justice, holiness, grace, mercy, and peace. That's good. Amen. Which would you rather have? What the world, the flesh, and the devil offer, which is brokenness, 
heartache, misery, hurt, despair, disease, enmity, hopelessness, bitterness, jealousy, envy, anger, selfishness, and death, more of what this crazy world already has, would you rather have that or what you can receive as a free gift today through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Eternal life, forgiveness, grace, mercy, peace, and righteousness. To me, there's no question. The Bible says that we have all broken this commandment that thou shalt not commit adultery. We've all broken this commandment in some way. How do I know that? Because Jesus said as much. I want you to turn to Mark chapter seven for just a minute. Mark chapter seven, verses 20 through 23. Mark seven, verses 20 through 23. Mark 7, 20 through 23. This is where Jesus said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. That's what Jesus said. We all have that problem in our heart. In fact, uh, Jeremiah the prophet says that our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And Paul the apostle tells us that the wages of sin, that the payment for sin is eternal death. And he, but he also reminds us with these words. Paul says that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. Wow. So if you read what Paul said, then you have to ask the question, well, then who can be saved? Who can go to heaven? Who is righteous enough? Who is perfect and sinless? Because we've all sinned. We're all lawbreakers. We're guilty of breaking the commands in so many ways, whether in thought, word, or deed. How can anyone be saved and go to heaven? It, it seems and sounds impossible, doesn't it? But there is a way and it is available to any and all who will have it. And what is that way? That way is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father, no one goes to heaven, but by and through Jesus. He is the door, he is the gate. So, let's, let's finish with this verse. Turn to 1 Corinthians 6. This is where that passage is that I just read from Paul. 1 Corinthians 6, start in verse 9. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. After Paul said that, look at what he said. And such were some of you, but you were washed, 
You were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Isn't that great news? Amen. God can completely change your life from what you are now to something completely new. God can convert you through your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ so you can say, you are now a new person in Christ. The old has passed away, the new has come. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. God can make it to where what you were doesn't define you anymore. It's being a child of God, born again, walking in newness of life that now defines you. You are a Christian. You were a sheep going astray, but you have returned to the Lord, the shepherd and overseer of your soul. You can be a part of the group of believers where Paul defines them as such were some of you. You're not that way now. You used to be, but God completely changes the trajectory of your life. So how does he do that? The first thing I would tell you is atonement. Christ suffered, bled, and died for you on an old Roman cross. He committed no sin and was your substitute. Who is perfect and sinless? Who can go to heaven? Well, Jesus, he's the only one that ever was perfect and sinless. He took your place and died for you on an old rugged cross. He atoned and paid for your sin there. And three days later, he arose from the dead and he defeated sin and death. And the Bible says, whosoever believes in him will not perish, but will have everlasting life. That's atonement. That's how God makes it possible for you to be saved. Why would God do that? Because of love. That's why. We mentioned this verse earlier today. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. That is what Jesus said, and that's also what he did for you and me. God, the Bible says that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So how did he do it? Through atonement. Why did he do it? Because of love. And what do we do now? What's the next step? Trust him. Believe in him. And receive him. That's the next thing. Receive forgiveness, peace, new life, eternal life, righteousness, and all of the other benefits that salvation brings. Stop settling for life as you know it and don't accept the world the way it is. Don't make your home here. It's not a good place right now. God will make it better one day. But make a difference. Come into the light, come out of the darkness, leave the dominion of darkness and come into the kingdom of light and life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the answer. That's the antidote to, to sin for all of us. The good news of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope that there is in Christ. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that has yet to give up and let go and believe in Jesus, maybe Lord, today would be the day where they would want to say, Pastor, I'm tired. I keep trying, but it doesn't work. I need a change. I need Jesus. I pray he'll come into my life. He'll save me, clean me, make me a new person. Thank you, Lord, for your atonement for me, for death, for your death, your burial, your resurrection. Come into my life, Lord, and help me to walk and newness of life. Make me a new person. And Lord, I'll strive to follow you all the days of my life. 
Lord, maybe someone needs that today. May you be glorified. And Lord, maybe others here need to repent. Maybe they've found themselves stuck, backslidden, bound in this area of their life of sexual sin. Lord, they need freedom and you will give it to them. Lord, just pray that you'd have your will and your way with us now as we sing this last hymn and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.